Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing voltage-gated ion channels. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, and uh, specifically we're now looking at the accessory subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, which are these additional subunits that you can attach on to an alpha-1 subunit of a voltage-gated calcium channel, which can modify the properties of the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel. So we've discussed now beta subunits which attach onto the alpha interaction domain and alpha-2 delta subunits which are uh, either transmembrane uh, proteins where the delta subunit is uh, a transmembrane protein uh, or they are attached to the to the outer side of the cell membrane by glycosyl phosphatidyl and ositol linkage. Okay, what I now want to discuss is the gamma subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so next up is the gamma subunits. Now, there are eight different gamma subunits uh, of voltage-gated calcium channels, and these are called the CAV gamma 1, the CAV gamma 2, the CAV gamma 3, and all the way up to the CAV gamma 8. Okay, so CAV for voltage-gated calcium channel, gamma for the gamma subunit, and then CAV gamma 1 all the way up to CAV gamma 8. Okay, right. So let me now show you uh, the structure then of all of these eight uh, gamma subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so they are integral membrane proteins, and they have four membrane-spanning alpha helices. So if we let this represent once again the cell membrane, this is the extracellular fluid, this is the cytoplasm, uh, then uh, the gamma subunit will be like so. The N and C termini are both cytoplasmically located, and then we have the four membrane-spanning alpha helices in between uh, the N and C terminals. Okay, so here they are in green here. Right, okay, so uh, the gamma subunits, you can attach a single gamma subunit to an alpha-1 subunit of your uh, voltage-gated calcium channel. So it's one gamma subunit per voltage-gated calcium channel, as was the case for the beta and the alpha-2 delta subunit. Okay, now where can it actually be attached? Well, it's believed that, again, it sits in between uh, the voltage-sensing domains of domain number 2 and domain number 3 of the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, so where in this little slot where the alpha-2 delta subunit is also located. So here now, this is the gamma sitting in this slot as well with the alpha-2 delta there. Okay, and uh, many voltage-gated calcium channels do indeed have all three of these accessory subunits, a beta, an alpha-2 delta, and a gamma subunit. So what does the gamma subunit now do? Well, it it is again involved in changing the threshold potential for activation, so changing what voltage you have to depolarize up to in order to actually get the alpha-1 subunit to open. Okay, so again, threshold, and it's also involved in affecting the amount of time it takes to inactivate, so the speed at which the uh, alpha-1 subunit inactivates, basically. Okay, so two key properties of the voltage-gated calcium channel that are affected by the gamma subunits there. Okay, right, so that's another important accessory subunit of voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, right, so now to finish with, what I want to do is just talk about uh, some molecules then that can block uh, the voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so the first ones that I want to talk about are uh, antagonists for L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, okay? And these are small molecules, okay, uh, which are grouped into three main classes. So we're now talking about drugs uh, that can be used to affect the activity of L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. And remember, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels are those voltage-gated calcium channels where the alpha-1 subunit, the principal subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel, is uh, one of those CAV1 family alpha-1 subunits. 
Okay, right. So L-type voltage-gated calcium channel blockers is what I now want to talk about. Okay, so there are three great families of drugs which are all called L-type voltage-gated calcium channel blockers, and they do indeed all bind within the pore of L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. However, one of these classes isn't really functioning as a blocker of the pore. It doesn't block the pore. It works in a more subtle way, okay? So that's going to be the first category that we talk about. So the first major family of L-type voltage-gated calcium channel blockers is the dihydropyridine family of drugs. And indeed, L-type voltage-gated calcium channels present within skeletal and cardiac muscle are often called dihydropyridine receptors after this famous class of drugs uh, which can bind in their pore and affect their behaviour. So dihydropyridines, and it's a massive great class of drugs involving many uh, clinically used examples for various conditions. Okay, uh, now the sort of key example of a dihydropyridine is nifedipine, it's the sort of prototypical example. Okay, right, so that's an example of a dihydropyridine drug. So what do these drugs actually do? Well, they do go into the open pore, bind to the pore at some point, but they don't seem to function by blocking uh, the actual uh, channel. Instead, it seems that by binding, they alter the opening mechanism of the channel. Okay, so it seems that they disturb the opening mechanism, and once the drug is bound to an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, it seems to make it much more difficult for that L-type voltage-gated calcium channel to then open again uh, if the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is depolarized uh, to um, beyond the threshold potential. So basically, if you've got an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel with a dihydropyridine drug bound within its pore, the actual chance that it will open if you depolarize the electrical potential difference to beyond the threshold potential for this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel is hugely reduced compared to what it would be if the dihydropyridine wasn't there. So it seems that the knife that the dihydropyridine binding to uh, the pore affects the gating mechanism in some way and stops voltage changes actually being able to cause the channel to open, okay, rather than the drug being a simple channel blocker, basically. The other two classes are believed, however, to be more simple and just to be channel blockers. Okay, so the next class that I'm going to tell you about are the phenylalkylamines. Okay, so the phenyl alkylamines. Okay, and the key example of a phenyl alkylamine is the drug verapamil, which also has a number of clinical uses. Okay, so verapamil can go in and bind uh, to uh, the pore of an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, and it does appear just to simply block the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So it's an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel open channel blocker. Okay. Similarly, the next class of drugs we also think are just uh, simple channel blockers. Okay, and this is the class of drugs called the benzothiazepines, not to be confused with the benzodiazepines, which are anxiolytic and uh, sedative drugs. Okay, right, and the key example of a benzothiazepine is the drug uh, diltiazem. Okay. And again, uh, these drugs seem to bind to the pore of L-type voltage-gated calcium channels and just block the pore, basically, and stop calcium ions from being able to move through. Okay, so these are all very important drugs for blocking the activity of L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, right. Now I'm just going to mention some other molecules, some other toxins specifically, that are capable of blocking other types of voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, uh, so the first one that I want to mention is a toxin from a certain type of spider called a funnel spider, which is known as omega agatoxin. Oops, uh, omega agatoxin, and it's specifically omega agatoxin 4A. Okay. So, omega agatoxin 4A comes from a type of spider called a funnel spider, okay? 
and it is capable of binding to the extracellular aspect and blocking the entrance to the pore of PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so remember, PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channels are those voltage-gated calcium channels where the alpha-1 subunit is CAV2.1. Okay, so PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel is simply one where the alpha-1 subunit is CAV2.1. So basically, these funnel spiders create this molecule, omega agatoxin, which is capable of binding to uh, the outer aspect of uh, the CAV2.1 alpha-1 subunit within uh, the PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channels, and it just blocks the extracellular entrance to the pore, and therefore makes those PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channels unfunctional, okay? And these are very powerful neurotoxins as well, because remember I told you that um, PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channels, they're important in the axon terminals of neurons, okay? They're important for turning action potentials that arrive in the axon terminals of neurons into calcium signals that can then cause exocytosis, okay? If these have now been blocked by omega agatoxin at 4A, and then basically neurons are going to really struggle turning action potentials arriving in axon terminals into the release of neurotransmitter. N-type voltage-gated calcium channels are there as well, so they will still be functional, okay? But you're going to have much less neurotransmitter being released, basically. So you're going to hugely reduce synaptic transmission, basically. Okay, so again, a very potent neurotoxin. Um, okay, so another example then of a neurotoxin which is capable of blocking the other type of uh, voltage-gated calcium channel found in axon terminals, so specifically N-type voltage-gated calcium channels, which remember are those voltage-gated calcium channels where the alpha-1 subunit is CAV2.2 type, okay? Uh, this neurotoxin that's capable of blocking the uh, N-type voltage-gated calcium channels comes from a type of snail called a cone snail, okay? And this um, neurotoxin is called uh, omega conotoxin G6A, okay? So omega conotoxin and then G. Uh, 6A, so let me just get my Roman numerals right, 6A here. Okay, and it is important that it's specifically omega conotoxin G6A because there are a lot of conotoxins and there are a lot of agatoxins, so you can't omit any of these uh, bits, basically. You can't just call this omega conotoxin and you can't just call this omega agatoxin. You need the clarifying bit, okay, because different omega agatoxins and different omega conotoxins do different things, basically. Okay, but this omega conotoxin G6A, this binds to the extracellular aspect of the pore of N-type voltage-gated calcium channels, and it's going to block calcium from being able to move through, and again, therefore, is a very potent neurotransmitter uh, inhibitor, uh, so it inhibits the release of neurotransmitter release, and therefore, it's a very powerful uh, neurotoxin. Okay, produced by this dangerous type of snail. Okay, right. So that now concludes my discussion of voltage-gated calcium channels and also my discussion of voltage-gated ion channels.